I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about the growing conflict with the Houthis of Yemen in the Red Sea, we have with us Dr. Elliot Cohen, a frequent guest to the podcast. Welcome back, Dr. Cohen. It's so good to have you here. Always good to be with you, Andrew. Elliot, I want to ask you, let's just start out. Who are the Houthis and what is their connection to Iran? So the the Houthis really started off as a kind of a minority Shia sect in Yemen and participants in the whole series of civil conflicts that have racked that country now for many years. They've linked up with the Iranians. And as part of that, I think their own self-conception of their role in the world has changed. And I think that's by the way, part of how we should understand what they are doing. I mean, part of what they're doing is essentially performative politics of a kind. It's it's not particularly strategic in the sense that they think they're going to, you know, drive the United States out of the Persian Gulf. But, you know, you put your finger on, on what's really the critical thing, which is the link to Iran. Yemen is an impoverished country and the Houthis do not build their own radars. They do not build their own cruise missiles. They do not build their own ballistic missiles. They don't kind of put together the targeting information that you need to attack ships. They are acting as yet another of Iran's proxies, which may not mean that they are always completely controlled by Iran because these relationships are complicated, but it it needs to be understood, I think, as part of a larger picture. Yeah, the thing I think a lot of Americans scratch their head and say is, you know, this is a, if they know who these people are at all, this is a group of people that don't have water, they don't have power, they don't have food, but all of a sudden they have these missiles that are striking U.S. assets and U.S. allies. So how can that even be only through Iran, right? It really is only through Iran. And there's been plenty of reporting that indicates that there are Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps operatives there who are helping them with all this. And, you know, I think that there's benefit to each side. From the Houthis, they get to be big players in the world. And, you know, they are to some extent, I think, intoxicated by their rhetoric and intoxicated by the idea of taking on the United States, Israel and and others. And so there's a kind of psychic benefit, which is doesn't put food on the table for, for Yemenis, but is a psychic benefit. And for Iran, it's part of a much larger and to this point really quite successful model of proxy warfare where the Iranians don't have to engage the United States directly, but they can achieve their objectives in the region. And those objectives are, I think, quasi-imperial. It's to establish Iranian hegemony in a very broad way. They're also partly sectarian. And there's, there's some tension between those. So, for example, if you look at the Iranian relationship with Hamas, on the one hand, as as we saw when a CSIS group that I led went to Israel, they provided Hamas with a lot of the weaponry, a lot of the training. But there's still a bit of tension there, which is largely sectarian, or at least partially sectarian, partly ethnic Arab versus Persian. So it's it's a mixed relationship. But on the whole, this has been a very successful strategic approach for the Iranians. I want to get to your trip to Israel in a minute, but before we leave the Houthis, the other question that has Americans and people all over the world scratching their head is, why is the United States and our allies playing around with these people and letting them strike our interests, almost it seems like it will, and not really doing all that much to retaliate? Why are we allowing this? Well, that's a very good question, and I, uh, you know, I've got uh, some theories, but it is somewhat baffling. I think the permissive condition is that American and Allied warships have the ability to knock down most of these missiles as they're coming in. So, you know, you don't feel the immediate pressure that way. I think this administration has had a very pervasive fear of escalation just about anywhere you look. We've certainly seen that in Russia and Ukraine, and you and I have talked about that in terms of being willing to supply Ukraine with the weapons that it needs. I think there's a fear of escalation here with Iran that you could have something really blow up in the Persian Gulf that would interrupt oil supplies. And there's another side to it, which is there's been a part of the administration which has been very keen to return to the JCPOA, to the nuclear deal with the Iranians, which I don't think is actually such a such a good idea. So there's hesitation about it. There's also, I think, a a particular American tendency to want to narrow the problem and to make this, well, this is a Houthi problem. 
It's not a Houthi problem. I mean, it is, of course, a Houthi problem. It's also an Iran problem. And the truth is, if you're going to use military power in such a way as to get the Iranians to stop, you'd have to strike at a bunch of Iranian targets, primarily in Yemen. And it's not enough to blow up missile launchers. You have to go after the people operating them. That's what the Iranians are sensitive to. They've always been sensitive to that whenever we've, on the few occasions when we've actually tackled them directly. So blow up people, not things. Right. I mean, it's important to blow up things too, but if you want to achieve a strategic effect, the IRGC has to be losing people. I understand the administration doesn't want to escalate yet another conflict, but at what point are we strategically not thinking about our interests by not doing something more serious? Well, I think we're already in that situation. You know, in a way, it's like the precipitate withdrawal from Afghanistan, which we also talked about. These things have second and third order consequences. If people see, in the case of Afghanistan, the United States just washing its hands of a war in which for 20 years we put in blood and treasure, people draw conclusions from that. Well, in a similar way, if, if people see that you can attack American ships with impunity, they take lessons from that. Now, we've begun striking back, but when you look at what, at least the way the strikes have been reported, they are mainly against inanimate things. They're against missile launchers and so on. That's never really going to be, that's a mugs game because what you're doing is, first, it's a lot more expensive to take out a missile launcher or a radar than to put in a new one. But it doesn't, the other thing is it doesn't instill fear on the other side. And it's, you know, this is very elemental stuff. Last point I'd, I'd make on this one, Andrew, is that the United States remains the dominant maritime power in the world. And with that comes a certain responsibility to maintain freedom of the seas. And if people see that the world's leading naval power is not willing to maintain the freedom of the seas by acting decisively, that is part of a kind of a larger strategic shift against us, which is very worrying. So essentially what that is, is a pirate nation or a group of pirates taking down the greatest maritime force to ever sail the earth. In the article I just wrote in The Atlantic yes. uh, about this, I use exactly that phrase, a pirate state. I and mean, we've dealt with pirates in other contexts, you know, pirates off Somalia and, and others. We have had experiences of dealing with pirate states, and that goes back to the early years of the of the Republic. There's, of course, the, the first Barbary War, which is 1801 to 1805, uh, really 1804, which was war essentially with Tripoli. And of course, this is how the Marine hymn ends up from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Also, right. anybody who knows the Marine Corps knows that their dress sword is a you know, rather fancy kind of Ottoman sword, and that goes back to Tripoli. But, the, but that was a very unsatisfactory outcome, actually, because what happened was we ended up negotiating a deal with the Pasha of, of Tripoli in which we got American prisoners back, but we paid what we called ransom, $60,000 but which they viewed essentially as tribute. Now, what's interesting and I think more instructive, and I talk about this in the article, is the Second Barbary War, which people know very little about. This was a war that was declared by Congress and by, the, by President Madison literally within weeks of ratifying the Peace of Ghent, which brought an end to the War of 1812. And in 1815, we sent basically the entire United States Navy to Algiers, but actually to deal with all of the Barbary states. What had happened was at the beginning of the War of 1812, as American ships are withdrawn from – naval vessels are withdrawn from the Mediterranean, the Barbary states go back to their old ways and they are taking American shipping and holding people hostage and all that. Disrupting commerce. Disrupt, absolutely disrupting commerce. And what's really interesting about that is, at first, we send over our first ship of the line, the USS Independence. And then what's critical is the, the mission is initially led by Stephen Decatur, one of the great heroes in American naval history. Thus, the name of this terrific article, The Decatur Option. The Decatur Option. And what, what's interesting is Decatur shows up in Algiers. And the day of Algiers tries to begin a traditional negotiation, and Decatur has none of it. He says, look, we're blockading the port. We're going to take any ship that comes in or goes out. He, he had actually begun by taking, I think it was the largest Algerian warship. And he says, you're going to release not only the American prisoners you've got, you're going to release all the Europeans as well. There's not going to be any ransom. There's not going to be any tribute. And if you don't go along with that, we're going to sink your navy and we're going to bombard your town. And the day of Algiers collapsed. And then 
you know, as did the other Barbary states. By the way, this was the beginning of the end for the Barbary states because they, the European powers were quite impressed by this, the British and the French. And in very short order, actually, the, uh, the French end up taking Algeria. This is partly because we had kind of cracked that open. Until then, the European states had tolerated having the, the Barbary pirates out there. But the, the point is, these are pirate states. And the Houthis are essentially a pirate state. And you have to deal with them that way. So I think any kind of tit for tat, sort of low level strikes and stuff, that's absolutely the wrong way to deal with them. Right. So the, so far what we've done is we've approached it with a proportionality or what we think is proportional. So, you know, hitting some radar, hitting some inanimate objects, as you point out. But that's not going to stop this. No, the whole point is to be disproportionate. I mean, first, the whole idea of proportionality in a situation like this is a little bit absurd. I mean, we're not, they don't have super tankers that we can fire missiles at, and they don't have warships that'll shoot down the missiles. Right. There's no targets. There's, right. But the whole point, if you really want to prevent pirate states like the Houthis from doing this, they have to really feel that the hammer is going to come down on them. And it has to be a hammer. And that has to go absolutely for the Iranians, too. We tend to think less than we should about the nature of our opponents' weaknesses that we can exploit. The weakness of the Houthis is they are really dependent on the Iranians for weapons, for training, all that. The weakness of the Iranians is they do not want an all-out conflict with the United States, in part because they know that their own grip on power is actually brittle and that in a real war with the United States, there would be a good chance that you'd have an internal revolution there. You know, one of the key elements of strategy, I think, is you play to your opponent's weaknesses. We know what those weaknesses are and we should play to them. Really fascinating point. Now, of course, all of this is part of the larger situation going on in Israel right now, Israel and Gaza, Israel still fighting Hamas, dealing with Hezbollah to the north. You were just there. Tell me what you learned while you were there. So I led a uh, small CSIS delegation, including my colleague uh, Seth Jones and uh, Dan Byman, a couple of other experts, including Major General McRyan, uh, formerly of the Australian Army, who's also affiliated with CSIS. This is the CSIS dream team, if you will. It, uh, I'd like to think of it that way. <laughs> Plus, we had a number of other experts with us. We got a terrific access from the Israeli military, intelligence, and political establishment even. We were there for about a week and a half. We spent a day along the Gaza border. We saw several of the kibbutzim which had been attacked. We also saw on that trip uh, this probably the most horrifying thing I've ever – it is the most horrifying thing I've ever seen, which is a film the Israelis have put together, which is – no commentary. It's just 47 minutes of clips from uh, closed circuit TV and dash cams and body cams. That they retrieved from uh, Hamas fighters. Some of From those. Hamas fighters, also from uh, some of the victims shortly before they were killed. And I'm not going to – I will just say I did not sleep really for about a week and a half after seeing that video. It, it is – I've seen some hard things. Yeah. It is the most horrifying – thing I've ever seen. And the the kind of wanton and deliberate brutality of what Hamas did is extraordinary. So we, we saw the kind of the front lines in Gaza, and then we went up to the north and to the Lebanon border, and we met with a lot of people. So just a couple of dominant impressions. One is it, it is a society that's been traumatized. One of the ways to think about it is if you want to get a sense of what the impact on Israeli society is, multiply all the numbers by 30 and imagine it happened in the United States. So imagine instead of one 9-11, a dozen or 15 happening on one day. The Israelis had about 1,200 people killed on that day. It's the equivalent of about 40,000 Americans being massacred, 9,000 of them soldiers. Okay. 240 hostages taken, so that would be like... 7,000 U.S. hostages. U.S. hostages. And instead of hundreds of rapes, thousands. That, I think, gives you a sense of the dimension of what they've gone through, let alone the stuff happening on the northern border and stuff. One of the profound things I took away was the society itself is traumatized, although resilient. I, I should also say that. But you know, we met a lot with military and intelligence officials. They had a, a different kind of trauma, a deep sense of shame and guilt and having kind of betrayed the contract with Israeli civil society. That's really very, very deep. 
and the wrestling with that right now. I think the result is, as is typically the case with Israel, they recover very quickly from disaster. They adjust, they adapt, they're innovative and creative. Having said that, the first thing is this, the failure here was really at every possible level, the political, the strategic, the operational, tactical. And the other thing is, it's not clear to me that there's a kind of a clear strategic vision in the, mid right? in the middle of all this. No, because, you know, again, think back to my rule of 30. You know, after that kind of massive attack, you're, of course, going to respond. You know, if you think for two moments about what would have happened if you know, this had come out of Mexico or Canada, what the American response would have been. The problem is that the speed of that and the emotion associated with that can make it hard to figure out, okay, well, what do we do on the day after? On top of which, they're, they're dealing with a very difficult operational environment. And remaining hostages over well over 100. Right. Remaining hostages. You know, they don't really know how many are alive. And operating in a very difficult urban terrain, which has been very heavily fortified. I mean, one of the things, there was just a piece in the New York Times today, that the tunnel systems are even more extensive than people thought. I mean, you're talking about maybe 350 miles worth of tunnels, 5,000 shafts from the surface down. And that's just Gaza. We're not even talking about Hezbollah. And that's the other thing that is very striking. So, I mean, Hezbollah immediately began attacking the Israelis when this happened. And it's been just constant fire back and forth on that line with serious casualties. One of the things, again, the Israelis confront now is they've got an internally displaced population of around 200,000. Right. So, so Hezbollah and Hamas have effectively shrunken Israel. Yeah. I mean, so basically the Israelis have pulled back about five to seven kilometers from the contact line in each case. But it's the hotels we stayed at, you could see people who had were there from either the north or from the south. Again, to give people a sense of the dimensions of this, it would be like having maybe six million American internally displaced people. So there's that. And from the Israeli point of view, you know, when they look at Hezbollah, they see a force that is actually structured somewhat similarly to Hamas. I think Hamas learned from Hezbollah with a similar kind of concept, which is, you know, a simultaneous attack all along the border to take over the settlements and farms and so on, and take people hostage and move back. So the Israelis will not tolerate that indefinitely. And I came away thinking that there's a very good chance that at some point the Israelis will move north to clear out Hezbollah south of the Litani River. Now, again, the Hezbollah probably has something like about 150,000 rockets and missiles stockpiled. They have a larger kind of elite infantry force than Hamas did. It would be very, very ugly. And But I think the Israelis, one of the things to take away from, the, that the Israelis take away from this experience is that they can no longer really count on strategic warning. And so they will be inclined, I think, to attack, not preemptively, because preemptive war is when you see somebody getting ready to throw a punch. I think they'll be more inclined to attack preventively. That's when I know this guy is deeply hostile to me. He hasn't clenched his fist yet, but I know that at some point he will, and I won't be able to react while he's clenching his fist. So I think there's a good chance that you'll have a much larger war up north. And, you know, this is part of the resilience, I think, that you talk about. You know, I keep thinking back to 73, of course, when Moshe Dayan, the Israeli military intelligence establishment, was caught unaware. They came back from that very quickly and restored order. This almost feels like it's more daunting and scarier and more traumatic in a way. It is unquestionably more traumatic because it's a multi-layer of failure. I think it's an attack on Israel proper. This was not like the Sinai front or even the Golan Heights at the time. Where the people, where most of the Israelis were, were actually removed from the conflict. This is where it's at their, in their home. It's homes. right there. Yeah. The, the level of kind of cruelty and brutality is much more extensive, but also the sense of many different kinds of failure, political, strategic, operational, tactical, organizational. And it, it's a much more comprehensive failure. One Israeli said to me, we're a nation of lions led by donkeys, to which my response was, well, that may well be the case, but it's better than the other way around. I mean, the other side of this is we met with some of these people who, like, for example, this incredible retired General Noam Tibon, whose son was kind of hiding in the safe room at Nahalos, which is a settlement right on the Gaza border. 
And he just kind of grabs his pistol and he and his wife drive down there at leaving around 7.15 in the morning and lots of different things happened to him along the way, a lot of close calls and so on. And But at 2.30, he ends up saving his his son and grandchildren. But there's a lot of terrible stories. There's a lot of really remarkable courage as well. And the Israeli society, which had been internally really torn, just pivoted on a dime. And so you had the the same organizations which had been organizing protests doing things to help take care of soldiers, to get people the equipment that they needed. The problem after this happened was not people leaving the country. The problem was finding enough places on airplanes for all the people who wanted to come back. I mean, something like about 200,000 people came back, which is, again, it's that's extraordinary. Well, and now scores of American Jews who want to go over there, who are restraining themselves from doing it because they don't want to take up space in these hotel rooms and they don't want to take up resources, but they do want to help. Yeah. And, you know, I think the thing is also Israel's feeling, they're feeling isolated. They're also, they're quite aware of the the rise in anti-Semitism around the world. So it's a very tough time. After this happened, there were all kinds of calls for leadership changes. And even though, you know, the Israelis said, we're not going to deal with that right now, we're going to deal with what's right in front of us. Are they still very much in that mode? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, the politics has been, the internal politics has been suppressed. It hasn't, but it hasn't gone away. You know, the immediate triggering event, which was going to be an overhaul of the Supreme Court, the Israeli Supreme Court, that's, I think, been shelved indefinitely. That was one of the main things that was tearing Israeli society apart. But look, the, the senior leadership of the Israeli military and intelligence community, they've said, we're going to resign when this thing is over. I mean, they are taking responsibility and they are holding themselves accountable. I mean, the only person who is not is Bibi Netanyahu and who is, I think it's fair to say, a pretty widely despised character at this point, but is clinging to power. And just because of the the structure of Israeli coalitional politics cannot be forced out immediately. But when things calm down, I don't think there's any question that he'll be forced out. What will be particularly interesting is I, I think you're going to see a real transformation of Israeli politics as a result of this. You're going to have a lot of people who have come out of Gaza having served who are now politically energized in a different way than they were even before. I mean, large parts of Israeli society were getting politically energized before, but I think even more after this. So I think you're going to see a new cast of characters. You'll probably see some new parties. Political deck, as it were, is being reshuffled. And what about the immediate mission in Gaza? Does it feel like they have the upper hand strategically? Does it feel like things are going along as planned? Does it feel to you like this could end anytime soon? So they have already shifted to what's essentially their planning system. And I don't know that they really had this planned out in the kind of detail that we would. Their first phase was going to be one of essentially mobilizing forces and a lot of air attacks. They did that. Then a really large-scale incursion, particularly into the northern half of the Strip. Then there's a third phase, which I think they're beginning to go into now, which is much more more targeted, sort of substantial incursions and pulling back. They have trained and developed technology to deal with tunnel warfare. I think the scale of it is larger than they expected. It is innately going to be very slow and painstaking. And they are, I think, being as careful as one can reasonably be about civilian casualties. I mean, inevitably, there are a lot of civilian casualties. I, you know, the thing I keep on quoting to people and reminding them is, when we liberated Manila, which was a friendly city, in February of 1945, we killed 100,000 civilians. I mean, it just... That's an astonishing number. Given how crowded Gaza is, given the fact that it is it is entirely a fortified zone. And given that Hamas has very deliberately embedded itself with the civilian population, there are going to be civilian casualties. So I think what's happening now is this is sort of a slow grinding form of warfare. It is not going to be fast and decisive. I don't think the Israelis expect it to be. I think this will go on for months and months. I think they will eventually get Yahya Sinwar, Mohammed Daif, and the other senior leaders who planned this. And I think that's the intent. And I think they will destroy most, though not all, of Hamas. And the question really is going to be what's going to happen after that. The way to begin is, I think, by understanding that things are not going to go back to anything like the status quo ante. I think the the border around Gaza is essentially going to become like the DMZ in Korea. 
It'll probably be mined and, you know, really virtually impenetrable. So to a much greater degree than it was before. No more thousands of workers from Gaza coming into Israel to I, work. I cannot imagine the Israelis letting a single worker in from Gaza because one of the things that the Israelis are convinced of is that the exquisite intelligence that Hamas had about each of these kibbutzim was from Gazan workers who were working there. Because, for example, the – Who are working in Israel. Who were working – and were working on some of those kibbutzim because, yeah. so that they knew where the security systems were. One of the things, for example, that they did is the first house that they would attack would be the house of the person who was in charge of the local security. They knew where everybody lived. And they knew where everybody lived and, and it was all done very deliberately. So the Israelis will – and by the way, these were left-wing kibbutzim. So a lot of them were – He's next. Absolutely. They were people who were you know, taking Gazans to hospitals in Tel Aviv and so on. So they will never, I think, let Gazan workers back into Israel proper. But I also think they will from now on – Whenever they see a Hamas target of opportunity, they will hit it. And their tolerance of civilian casualties in that connection will be a lot higher than it was. And then the question is, you know, what happens to Gaza afterwards? I mean, it's a humanitarian disaster for sure. And I think what you'll probably end up with, I find it very hard to imagine the Palestinian Authority really taking it over. I don't think any country wants to run it. UAE, Egypt, I don't think so. Sweden, I rather doubt it. So I think what you're most likely to get is some kind of overarching authority, which will, may have a Palestinian authority fig leaf on it. But underneath that, you know, Gaza has traditionally had a kind of a clan-based society, the Hamulas, sort right. of family groupings. And, and they've also had professional societies and stuff. So I think the Israelis will probably try to, you know, under the table work with those groups. The problem is, and the question is, are those structures still intact? I mean, that place has just been through the Cuisinart of continued conflict and Hamas rule, which has been brutal and has, you know, also done an enormous amount of damage. Over the past 15 years, Hamas has Over the past 15 years. And, and then this war on top of it. So the question is, what is there to work with? And my guess is not a lot. So I think this is going to be a, this will be a kind of a running sore for decades. Will Israelis return to the kibbutzim in the south along the Gaza envelope, or will that also be land that is just mined and a bigger buffer? One of the things that was very impressive, we went to a kibbutz called Nero's, and we were showed around sure. by a, somebody who had survived the attacks. And they lost about a quarter of their people. But uh, the population of the kibbutz had been about 400. Beautiful place, you know, lovely, lovely little homes and uh, gardens and whatnot. And at the end of it, and it was... You know, you walk around, you felt as though this had happened yesterday because, you know, you see children's toys scattered about and burned out houses and pockmarks and bullet holes everywhere. The only thing that's been removed have been the physical remains of the human beings. And we talked to him at the end and about what the future is. He said, well, you know, as you can tell, we're still mo we mow the lawn. We take care of the livestock on the kibbutz. We still feed the cats because there was an old lady who used to feed all the cats. We make sure that we do that. He said, and uh, he said, what's going to happen is some people will come back. Other people will not come back. But I think what we really need to do is to double the size of the kibbutz and have a population of about 800 rather than a population of 400. Talk about resilience. This guy was really a model of resilience. And I think something like that will happen. I think you will get a lot of people who will not want to come back. But then I also think you'll get a lot of people You'll have people who do want to come back, and then you'll have other people who will be willing to move there. New people. Yep, I think so. Elliot, that gives me a lot of hope, uh, and I hope our listeners a lot of hope for the future. Thank you so much for this terrific interview and for your expertise and for your insight into all of what's going on over uh, in the Middle East right now. Always good to be with you, Andrew. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts. From Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 